morning, everyone. I want to invite you uh, to welcome you to the uh, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency meeting of Wednesday, May 25th, 2016. We'll begin with the flag salute. I will do the honors myself. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the clerk be kind enough to call the roll? Yes. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, now I'll ask for the approval of the minutes. Of the last second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the last meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay. Oh, one abstention. Euler abstains. Uh, agenda reviewers, is there anything on the agenda that anyone uh, wants to change or add or subtract? Seeing none, we'll move to public comment. Now is the time for anyone in the audience that wishes to address the commission on any, no, the agency directors. <laughs> I forget what committee I'm in happening. On anything that's not on the agenda, now is the time to come forward and state your name. Seeing none, we'll close public comment. We'll move to item F, the consent calendar. These items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They'll be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested citizen may request an item be removed from the consent calendar for discussion. Any, uh, Stickers? <laughs> Already, I'll ask for approval of the consent calendar. Move approval of consent calendar as presented. I'll second. Move and seconded to approve consent calendar. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. None? Okay. Now we're going to adjourn as the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency and convene as the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency. And we'll go to item G, uh, fiscal year 2015-16 budget amendment number two. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, we're today requesting you to adopt uh, budget amendment number two to the fiscal year 15-16 budget. Uh, the attachment one provides uh, the amendment number two operating budget. The um, operating revenues have increased by about four, less than four and a half percent due to a recent award of a uh, Caltrans, uh, Federal, well, Federal Transit Administration grant through Caltrans for elderly and disabled individuals and that grant was in the amount of uh, $70,000. Uh, there is a, a s very slight increase in the uh, operating expenditures to, uh, that the CTSA staff administration corresponds to the PCTPA uh, overall work program. That's less than a half a percent. With that, we are hoping to um, enter into fiscal year 16-17 with a uh, operating surplus of around $68,000. And with that, I'd be glad to respond to any questions. Any questions for staff? Anyone in the audience have any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll ask for uh, action. Move to amend the budget. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve, to adopt the fiscal year 2015-16 budget amendment number two. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is passed. Now, we're going to adjourn as the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency and convene as the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. We'll move to item H, Placer County Rural Transit Study. And uh, David Melko. Uh, good morning, members of the board again. Um, we're gonna <laughs> we're, today we're asking you to accept the uh, Placer County Rural Transit Study final report as complete and as a basis for evaluating future unmet transit needs in rural Placer County, excluding the Tahoe Basin. Uh, over you know, very, uh, multiple years, we've received numerous com comments on transportation needs in rural areas, and we have received those as part of the unmet transit needs process. We have recognized those and responded to those. In addition to that, we commissioned this study um, 
recognizing that there are those needs out there and that we probably needed to look at this on a more comprehensive basis. And so this study examined a wide range of transit, st transit strategies, and you all heard those um, in March as part of a public workshop. And we spent uh, a fair amount of time with our consultant going through a laundry list of transit strategies that might work uh, serving transportation needs in the rural areas. We also recognized at that time at the workshop that and acknowledged uh, to the board that many of these strategies will be difficult to meet transit industry standards because tran the transit industry standards are typically set for transit services in urban areas and we're dealing with a rural area. And so many of these um, strategies that we had reviewed with the board back in March, we had acknowledged wouldn't probably do very well. Nonetheless, there were six strategies that kind of rose to the top, and so we're recommending those strategies on a demonstration <coughs> basis. And so those are the list here that uh, we would ask the board to consider as part of uh, considering the, board, uh, the report complete. I'll briefly walk through those. Um, the, um, we're looking at um, a lifeline service along Sheridan State Route 193. That service would basically operate one day a week. It would operate as a fixed route, deviated service, so that it would meet the ADA responsibilities associated for public transit. Uh, the service we recommend would start as a reservation-based service, which means people who would ride the service would need to call in two days in advance in order to schedule the ride. This type of service is used in Yolo County as well as in El Dorado County. Those are the most closest examples in this region. And if you don't get the number of people that call in ahead to uh, schedule the ride, the service doesn't operate. Uh, it's estimated that the, um, by the consultant that the service would cost about 22,000 annually and carry about, about less than 750 one-way passengers per year. The second um, service that we're recommending for Forest Hill would operate in the same manner. It would be a one day per week lifeline service, uh, a route deviated uh, service, also with the reservation based requirements and it would come in at a cost of around $20,000 a year and carry close to 900 passengers. Um, the third service um, that we looked at is the Alta Colfax service. Uh, the Alta Colfax service is an existing service it operates service in the, in the mid-morning and mid-afternoon. And over the years, we've had people who have commented who live along that corridor, including uh, residents within the city of Colfax, that they can't get to work activities along the Highway 49 corridor in a timely manner. So what we're recommending here is that we adjust the service uh, schedule hours so that we adjust the hours so that the morning and the evening at, um, services are adjusted for work schedule. But because people also come down to Auburn to shop, we're recommending that we add a midday service um, so that when people come down in the morning, they have a four hour time to shop around and then come back during the midday rather than spending the whole day here uh, in Auburn, although maybe you won't. Auburn would like people to spend the whole day in Auburn. <laughs> um, the uh, cost for this service would come in at about $44,000 a year, and um, the service is primarily funded by Placer County because most of the route miles uh, and service hours are within uh, Placer County, but there is an existing funding arrangement between the county and the city of Colfax, and that would need to be reexamined if the service went forward. Uh, the service would increase passenger trips by almost 4,600 people annually, and so that's a, that's a positive. The, uh, the fourth service um, recommendation is in the Granite Bay area. Now, the Granite Bay area falls within the Sacramento urbanized area, and so the question is why would you look at Granite Bay uh, as part of a rural area? But we've heard loud and clear over a number of years about the, uh, the how the Granite Bay uh, community uh, considers its rural lifestyle. And so <laughs> um, I'm sure uh, the, the supervisor can appreciate that. And so we looked at that, and Placer County currently operates the dollar ride service within um, uh, the Granite Bay area. And uh, right next door is the city of Roseville, and they operate dollar ride service and fixed route bus service. 
And what we would recommend to Placer County is that Placer County consider contracting the dial-a-ride uh, service with Roseville. If the service was operated at the same level of service as Roseville dial-a-ride, uh, there would be an increase of about 500, 600 passenger trips per year, and actually would be a cost savings you know, to Placer County. So um, it's something for the county to consider. Um, the fifth um, uh, service recommendation would be looking at uh, a more detailed service review in the Auburn area. Uh, I think figure 23 of the report, if anybody wants to uh, flip through the pages here, probably you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, illustrates uh, the complexity of the services in the area. You have two services, Placer County Transit and the City of Auburn Transit that overlap. And when you have overlap of services there, you are competing for certain rides and it can affect productivity and it can affect efficiencies of the service. And so what we recommend here is that PCTPA conduct a detailed service review, but we would only rec conduct that detailed service review if the city and the county ask us to look at you know, that type of service. Uh, I guess the, the, the most recent example of that would be with Lincoln. And with the city of Lincoln, they had approached us because of issues with fare box recovery. And so we conducted a detailed uh, service analysis for them and ultimately we recommended that their best option would be to contract with Placer County. And that option eventually went forward and the city of Lincoln currently contracts with Placer County for transit services. So much in the same vein, uh, would be an examination there. Uh, like I had mentioned, it would need to be triggered by the city and the county asking us to do that. And then the last recommendation would be to look at uh, the van pool budget for Placer County. Currently, Placer County has a van pool program. It's primarily ori oriented to urban commuter needs. It's a 10 van program and while we, we can't say definitively whether you should expand the budget by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, we, you know, we ultimately came with a recommendation that a modest increase to the Van Pool uh, budget to address some rural transportation needs, particularly in the Forest Hill area, because we've noticed the number of people who live in close proximity and actually work you know, within the general Auburn and then also down in the Newcastle, Ophir, and the Loomis area. And so a van pool might actually work well serving those particular uh, individuals' needs. In doing so, that would be a 10% increase in the budget, and so that would result in about $27,000 per year. And we think that that would be a, a reasonable um, start to looking at a rural a van pool program. Of course, how do we fund this? Um, that's always the big question, and there are Transportation Development Act funds and state transit assistance funds that are available. There's also funding available through Low Carbon Transit Operations Program. Since these are new services, uh, those funds would be available to use for new services. Uh, the two lifeline services that I mentioned for Forest Hill and for Sheridan, uh, we also had noted within the report that perhaps a fare surcharge might be appropriate since it's a reservation-based service and you have to set up your resources in anticipation of people calling in and making the reservation in advance that it might be appropriate to have a surcharge <coughs> uh, for that type of service. There are some fun, there are some capital improvements associated you know, primarily in terms of bus stops and there are still uh, monies available through the Prop B program and those monies could be used uh, to fund those particular improvements. And as I noted earlier in this presentation, and as we really noted in March, that the, this type of service services are marginal at best, and these six here are probably the best for demonstration candidates. And so we're recommending that the Partnering jurisdictions in Placer County look at this and prioritize within their planning and their service budgets uh, as to whether these services can be uh, implemented within the near future. There is no specific timeline or uh, within this report or overall sequence in terms of when these should be recommended. And so therefore, it doesn't recommend a hard commitment 
on the part of the transit operators to go out and to implement that. And with that, uh, I'd be glad to take any questions. And uh, there may be individuals in the audience that may wish to speak. <coughs> and, um, All right, thank you. That's it. Any questions for staff? Uh, Director Nesmith? Yeah. Um, couple things, the, the, the detailed service review of the Auburn region, who all would be involved in that review that you see? Well, um, so if we follow the Lincoln example, uh, it, it was the city of Lincoln staff um, and started out with Placer County um, staff and with PCTPA. And so the work was done in-house by me. Um, if the Auburn um, service review was to be um, go forward, it'd be City of Auburn staff and Placer County staff because you actually have two transit operators overlapping. So those two um, entities would need to be together. And then it would be up to the entities whether they wanted PCTPA staff to do it or whether they wanted to seek consultant assistance. Okay. Um, I know that um, I, I brought the matter up and we're currently studying Bernie Schroeder's here, our, our public service, our public uh, Works. works. Yeah, Works, works Director. <laughs> Planning and Public Works is, um, is here. And, and we brought it up at the Council, and I know we we're, um, have instructed the staff to really look at ways um, on our bear box recovery ratio. It's been too many years since we've met it, and we're in the process of studying that. So I would ask that, that sooner rather than later that we would bring this part of that piece into that discussion while we're studying how to meet that fare box recovery ratio and actually exceed it, not just meet it. But uh, so I would ask some close coordination um, sooner rather than later on that. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments for staff? Anyone uh, in the audience wish to address the board of directors? <coughs> Good morning. Yes, Tink Miller, Executive Director of Placer Independent Resource Services here in Auburn. Um, and, and I'm very excited about this report. We've been involved in it all along. Um, David came and did a presentation with my board of directors and with our, our best step group. Um, I know that, that he and uh, Genevieve from LISC, uh, LSC have done extensive um, uh, uh, effort to interact with the public and get direct input. So I um, really appreciate the, the effort that went into this. And I hope that we can find the funding to launch some of these pilot projects. Uh, um, we very much support the recommendations that have been made. And uh, since uh, uh, Mr. Nesbitt brought up Auburn, um, we have people at my, uh, that my agency serves living in Auburn who have disabilities and, and are outside of a like a three-quarter mile corridor for the deviated routes. So I hope they'll look at routing as part of that review. And uh, I uh, assume that you all will approve this report. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Anyone else wish to address the board on this issue? <coughs> seeing none, seeing no more comments from board members, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Oh, you, huh? <laughs> oh, is there? All right, have another cup of coffee. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. And there is a first and second. So, any other further discussion? It's not funny. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, we'll move on to, thank you, we'll move on to item I, final fiscal year 2016-17 overall work program and budget. Yes, good morning, this item is mine and um, what you have before you is a final version of the preliminary overall work program and budget that you approved back in February. There are only really very minor changes from that and uh, that uh, some of the highlights of what is different in this versus what we're doing this year is the work program is much smaller in terms of we're finishing up on a number of initiatives such as the transportation funding strategy. Uh, 
but we are adding a, an initiative for a comprehensive update to the countywide bicycle plan. And as noted in your uh, staff memo, in the budget item, we had uh, expected to receive a grant for that. We have now uh, received confirmation that we did receive a $51,000 grant for the uh, comprehensive update, so that's good news. Um, and that will also help replenish the money that we have fronted this year going into our reserves a little bit to put together the fast lane grant for the 8065 interchange. So uh, financially, we look good going into next year. Um, there is a, a slight increase to our uh, accounting and auditing costs because of some new rules that have been put in place. And so there is a slight change to our staffing from 6.95 full-time equivalents to seven. I want to add though, things have changed a little bit since we put this together. And while we do want, uh, are still recommending that the board adopt this, we will be coming back to you with an amendment. And that is going to largely uh, uh, be focused on our congestion management program, which we've been doing for more than 20 years and using uh, congestion mitigation and air quality or CMAC grants for that. Our staff person who's been working on that, uh, Scott Aaron, um, has uh, put in his resignation. And so we, and, and he will be continuing on with us in a quarter time position doing our IT and, and computer management. But in terms of the congestion management program, that leaves us a little up in the air. And the timing actually ends up being pretty good. Um, not that we want to lose Scott at all, but um, at the same time, SACOG is looking at their transportation demand management, which is their version of the congestion uh, management program, and taking a hard look and reevaluating um, whether that is as effective as it needs to be. And um, I think that it's, it's a very valid point because there's concern that we're speaking to the same people over and over and not bringing more people into using alternative transportation. And uh, perhaps there are better uses of that congestion mitigation and air quality funds. So what I'm looking to do is to bring back an amendment this summer that would essentially suspend the program, take a look at what is working, what isn't, and then going forward with a, um, a probably going forward with a uh, majorly reduced and focused program on things that are effective, like the May is Bike Month uh, effort. So I, I did want to let you know that, uh, for example, while we're saying in here we're going to seven people, we're actually going back down to six and a quarter uh, folks um, and uh, really focusing our, uh, our efforts on making every buck count in, and be most effective. So I did want to put that out there and uh, you'll be seeing that this summer. But in the meantime, we do need a work program and budget and uh, I, staff is recommending the board approves this. All right, any comments from board members for staff? Seeing none, uh, anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? All right, well, we would bring it back to the board for action. I'll second. Moved and seconded to approve the final fiscal year 2016 overall work program and budget. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is passed. And now we will move to item J, I-8065 interchange improvements and Galleria Boulevard stamp Stanford Ranch Road, State Route 65 northbound ramps, improvements preferred project alternatives. <laughs> it's a lot. Just want to make everybody clear that's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Chair Holmes and members of the board. Uh, we're going to be giving a presentation on those two projects you just mentioned. And uh, we actually, oh, sorry, man. is it still on? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, we've actually shortened that for you. Uh, we're going to be giving a presentation on the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange and then that second project, Galleria Stamford Ranch, <coughs> the effect.
affectionately just call that the RAMS project. Uh, we're going to be giving an overview of the alternatives for the two projects, and then we're going to walk through the comments received on both of the draft environmental documents. So the Interstate 80, State Route 65 interchange actually has a, a large study area. It goes on Interstate 80 from Douglas Boulevard up to Rockland Road and on State Route 65 from Interstate 80 up to Pleasant Grove Boulevard. And then the ramps project is within that study area. We've developed four key goals uh, for both projects that we're using to uh, determine what the alternatives are. And these goals have in, had input from the project development teams, uh, which rep, you know, are shown by the uh, agencies here. And then also, of course, we received input from the PCTPA board and the public and our stakeholder groups. And those stakeholder groups are represented by residents and businesses within the study areas. So this is our problem. Um, most people have experienced this. This is southbound State Route 65 as you approach Pleasant Grove Boulevard. And this area is congested pretty much all day long from 6 a.m. until 7 p.m. And then if you're traveling north on State Route 65, approaching Galleria Boulevard, Stamford Ranch Road, traffic is backing up at that point also and it's backing up onto Interstate 80 in both directions. And this is a photo looking east on Interstate 80 from the Roseville Parkway overcrossing towards State Route 65. And then on westbound Interstate 80, looking towards State Route 65, we also have congestion occurring in this location. And this is actually the first point that most people experience congestion as they're traveling back from Tahoe and coming down uh, the hill there. So all this traffic congestion is resulting in a lot of serious accidents. And we've actually had 13 fatalities in the last six years uh, on both State Route 65 and Interstate 80. So through a partnership at the federal, state, and local levels, we've come up with an alternative that not only maintains the existing access at Taylor Road, it improves uh, safety, reduces traffic congestion, but it also eliminates the vehicle weaving that's occurring today on eastbound Interstate 80 between Eureka Road and State Route 65. And shown here is the four project alternatives that we looked at as part of the environmental document. And uh, the uh, project development team has determined that alternative two, the collector distributor system ramps, is the preferred alternative subject to public review. Then for the ramps project, if you're exiting from the Galleria Mall and then you're heading, you want to head north on State Route 65, so you want to make that left turn from Galleria Boulevard onto northbound State Route 65, that left turn backs up all the way along Galleria Boulevard. And there's some pictures here that show that. And then if you're exiting from northbound State Route 65 onto Stamford Ranch Road and you want to merge over to make a left turn on Five Star Drive, uh, Five Star Boulevard, Drive, Boulevard. 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 Uh, near the Costco area. Sorry. Uh, near the Costco area, uh, you're competing with a lot of different vehicles in that weave. And um, we would like to improve that situation. So through a partnership with the Highway 65 Joint Powers Authority, uh, Caltrans, and PCTPA, we've come up with some improvements for those northbound ramps. And it's actually a mirror image of what was completed for the southbound ramps in 2009. That includes uh, widening the northbound off-ramp to two lanes. We're going to signalize that off-ramp. And then we're also going to add a second left turn lane on Galleria Boulevard, turning onto northbound State Route 65. Uh, we actually began the environmental document for the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange in 2011. And over the last five years, we've had significant public outreach, including stakeholder meetings, community meetings, project newsletters, and a significant uh, online presence. And we began the preparation of the draft environmental document for that project in 2014. Then in March of 2015, uh, we began the ramps project. And the intention there was to do a separate environmental document that caught up with the 8065 interchange project. And for that project, uh, we also had three public meetings here at the PCTPA board. And then we also had a stakeholder meeting in January of this year. 
Uh, so our consultant project manager, Chris Benson from CH2M, is going to walk through the comments we received on the draft environmental documents. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Thanks, Luke. Um, <clears throat> as Luke mentioned, I'm going to go through some specifics on the types of comments we received from the public and what the project um, alternatives have done to address those comments. Uh, to start out, just some quick background on the public circulation for both projects. The 8065 uh, Project Environmental Impact Report and Environmental Assessment was uh, circulated to the public in August and September of last year, about a, almost a year ago. That was a 45-day review, and we received 11 total comment letters on that project. The uh, RAMPS project, uh, initial study mitigated negative declaration was circulated just a couple months ago in March. Uh, that was a 30-day review by the public, and we received uh, six comment letters on that. Overall, on, these, on this size of projects, uh, we didn't receive a lot of comments. <clears throat> so the next few slides want to go through um, some, sp we, we pulled out some specific comments that, that, that came forth from the public and want to talk about what the project has done to address those. Uh, we received a comment letter from a conservancy organization that really focused in on the secret ravine area and reducing, eliminating, minimizing impacts to the ravine from an environmental standpoint. And so this was one of the key uh, goals that the project development team had as we were developing alternatives. And one of the things we did in co close coordination with uh, some of the regulatory agencies, in this case National Marine Fisheries Service, was to uh, propose an outrigger system. And what an outrigger system is, is where we place two piers on either side of, of the creek, and we create a bridge structure on those piers, and then we set the roadway structure on top of that bridge structure. And so what it does is it spans the creek, it eliminates the need for piers in the creek, which is a plus for the regulatory agencies and addresses this comment. We also looked at some of the temporary impacts associated with the project. What is it gonna take and what what are the disturbances going to look like during construction? And one of the things we did was clearly identify and make some assumptions in the environmental document for what those, what those temporary improvements would need to look like. And you can see here in the graphic that we have um, you know, temporary access road that's specifically assumed in the environmental document, and we're going to bridge the creek temporarily. We're not going to actually place fill in the creek, which is a plus from a fish standpoint and other biological impacts. Another uh, comment that received was from a Loomis resident, uh, specifically related to making a direct connection to the hospital. Uh, instead of going uh, you know, westbound on 80 and getting off of Eureka and flipping back around and going to North Sunrise, create a direct connection into the hospital. This was actually discussed early on in the concept development process and was set aside for a variety of reasons. Environmental impacts are large, uh, would result in a lot of trees being removed. Um, a lot of right-of-way impacts here to the hospital area, parking impacts. Um, there were dis concepts discussed about going around to North Sunrise, that's even more environmentally impactful. Uh, the other big issue that came up, you can see this concept here, actually comes, it was developed based on alternative one. As Luke mentioned earlier, alternative two is the preferred alternative. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. This is shown based on alternative one. One of the key issues that Caltrans and FHWA had was creating local connections to a system interchange. This is a big freeway to freeway connection, and typically Caltrans and FHWA won't support local access to a system interchange. Um, that was another key driver for, for, for setting this, this idea aside. We received a comment related to property impacts along the Taylor Road businesses. Uh, the comment was geared towards minimizing, reducing property impacts. Uh, the project has done that. One of the key things that we looked at was this little thing. This ramp right here is really what's creating the impact to these, to these uh, businesses. The geometry of the ramp is 
designed, is, is according to the design speed of the ramp. One of the key goals of the project was to maintain high speed connections between the two freeway facilities. And so the design <laughs> speed of this was set um, in close coordination with Caltrans at a higher speed, 45 miles an hour. What that does is it pushes the ramp just a little bit into these properties, but we tightened it up as much as we possibly could in close coordination with Caltrans. We proposed some retaining walls along the outside of this ramp in place of cut and fill slopes, would have, which would have extended even more into these properties. Another thing we did is really tried to focus on not impacting buildings. Uh, buildings of these businesses, we're not impacting them. We're taking what we call little sliver uh, takes along the, the, the business frontages up against I-80. On the ramps project, we received a comment from a Roseville resident related to overall intersection uh, congestion in the area. We, like Luke mentioned, it's congested in this area. There's a lot of businesses. The comment was geared towards, you know, make sure we improve that. Uh, we've done a couple things to improve operations of this facility, Sanford Ranch Road, as well as uh, capacity. We're adding a right turn bay uh, from, you know, basically if you're coming from, say, Costco and you want to go across and go up northbound 65, we're adding a right turn bay right along the frontage of Costco. That'll increase capacity of the facility. As Luke mentioned earlier, we're adding a signal. Sorry, it was close. Um, we're adding a signal. If you're going northbound on 65, you want to get off and go to Costco. Uh, there's that weave that Luke alluded to earlier. We're, we're eliminating that weave condition by placing a signal like you have on the southbound direction at Galleria. That'll improve operation of the facility and reduce congestion. Here's a quick summary of overall agency comments that we received. Uh, in general, agency comments were supportive in nature, uh, encouraged uh, additional coordination, more coordination as the project moves into more, you know, later design and right away in construction phases, which is typical for a project of this nature. Uh, regulatory agencies, again, were very standard type comments and the project will comply as we move forward with the project. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Luke. He's going to talk a little bit more about the Okay, uh, so the project development team took into account the project need and purpose and also the comments we received on the environmental documents to determine the preferred project alternatives. And you, what you're seeing here are the four uh, project alternatives for the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange. And then we have a build alternative and a no build alternative for the ramps project. And there's a, there's a lot of information here, so each of you have a handout of this slide. Um, this is an alternatives comparison for the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange. I do want to note that the safety or the traffic accidents shown here are the existing accidents that have happened for the previously available three years. And all the build alternatives are anticipated to improve the existing safety conditions in both corridors. So uh, the project development team used the reduction in traffic congestion, uh, enhanced safety, decreased vehicle delay, improved travel speed and travel times to determine that alternative two, the collector distributor system ramps is the preferred alternative. We also have an alternatives comparison for the ramps project and you also have a handout of this. Um, for this project, the project development team determined based on the improvements in traffic operations and safety that the build alternative is the preferred project alternative. So staff is requesting the board to concur or support uh, the project development team recommendations to Caltrans for both preferred alternatives on each project. And then uh, we'll work with Caltrans and the Federal Highway Administration to finalize these environmental documents. So I want to touch a bit on uh, next steps. Um, this is a exhibit that's showing phase one of the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange as it stands today. And uh, we've pretty much cobbled together every dollar we can find um, to fund construction of this project. Uh, 
just so everyone's aware, what phase one includes is a third lane on northbound State Route 65 from Interstate 80 up to Galleria Boulevard, Stamford Ranch Road. Then it includes all the improvements we've talked about as part of the ramps project, and then an auxiliary lane from Galleria Boulevard, Stamford Ranch Road up to Pleasant Grove Boulevard. So all on northbound State Route 65. Uh, as shown here, we've worked with all the regulatory agencies over the last year, and I'm happy to say that we have concurrence letters from all of those regulatory agencies. That's huge. And so the next uh, steps are to get the permits and pay for mitigation so that we can be under construction with phase one in 2017. Uh, the total cost of phase one is $44 million, and we've pulled together uh, $38 million of that $44 million. And as Celia mentioned, um, we submitted a fast lane federal grant application for the remaining six million. And we anticipate hearing uh, whether we receive that funding or not in September of this year. <coughs> but of course, the ultimate goal is to have this under construction in 2017, that's phase one. The future phases are really gonna de be dependent on a new funding source for design and construction. And we're gonna be providing the public and other interested parties updates on our project website at www. 8065interchange.org. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for the comprehensive report. Uh, do we have any comments uh, from members, board members? No? Uh, anyone in the audience wish to address the agency board on this? Wow. Pretty good job. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Now uh, I'll bring it back and see uh, what the uh, what we want to do here. I'll move the uh, board of alternate appeal to all the board alternate. I'll second that. Okay, moved and seconded to approve the item, both items. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, the item is moved. And now we'll move to item K, the executive director's report, an update on transportation sales tax expenditure plan process. Um, yes, I have been uh, doing the, the tour of the expenditure plan uh, with the jurisdictions. As you know, that, that after the board directed that we begin the process of uh, placing a transportation sales tax ordinance on the ballot for November, the first step in that is to take the expenditure plan to each of the jurisdictions and to obtain a majority of jurisdictions representing a majority of the incorporated population and the Board of Supervisors representing the unincorporated population must approve the expenditure plan before that can come back to this board to decide whether to place the ordinance itself on the ballot and that would be scheduled for June. So far we have been to five jurisdictions. Uh, we have uh, passed, the, the expenditure plan has been approved by all five of those ju jurisdictions, including uh, Rockland, Colfax, Loomis, Lincoln, and Auburn. Um, and in fact, uh, most of those have been unanimous votes. Um, and so we're very happy about that. There's a, a widespread support of this expenditure plan. So we are going to Roseville next Wednesday and then to the Board of Supervisors on June the 21st before this board, <coughs> excuse me, has the opportunity to uh, make a determination on the ordinance and that would be on June the 22nd. And then should the board adopt the ordinance and want to have that placed on the ballot, then it goes back to the Board of Supervisors for the actual placement on the ballot, which I understand is largely a ministerial action. So. Um, Summary is, so far, so good. All right. um, and I, I have one other item I wanted to mention, uh, a, a bit of good news. Uh, Caltrans has completed the I-80 excavation under the Newcastle yeah. crossing. They did that early, which is great because they had to, they had rotating closures of lanes going westbound. Um, it did not result in the backups that they had feared, which is also great news and those uh, closures are now stopped because they have, they have uh, largely completed that project's excavation. They'll be working on finishing up those, uh, those 
raisings, that's what they're, it's the Raise 80 project, and we'll be working with them on doing a ribbon cutting ceremony probably in July. So stay tuned for that. All right. That concludes my report. All right. Uh, any questions for our executive director? Um, I, I just want to let you know at um, the Chamber Forum, Auburn Chamber Forum yesterday morning, commonly known as the Meddlers, uh, there was a pretty robust discussion about the transportation sales tax and um, everybody in the room was pretty much in agreement. There was one person that was had to look at it a little closer before they made any, but it was really a, a good presentation and uh, so congratulations on the hard work you're doing. Okay, thank you. So now we'll move to item L, which is board direction to staff. Uh, anything? North. North? Direction north. <laughs> Southwest. Uh, we got some direction. I don't care. <laughs> there are some information. <laughs> There's some informational items here for your review, uh, if you want to take a look at those. And with that, our next regularly scheduled Placer County Transportation Planning Agency board meeting will be June 22nd, here at the Placer County Board of Supervisors Chambers. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.